And I'm waking up Tony over there. Hi, Tony. Uh, w welcome everybody again to the Westside Computer Club. <laughs> This is the November edition, and we're going to have our format tonight. Uh, our presentation is going to be by Wayne. Uh, Wayne Pretzel is going to tell us about why he loves a hybrid over an electric vehicle, meaning his Tesla. So can't wait to hear this one, this story tonight. Um, who'd like to open up the floor with the first question of the evening? I would. Oh, look. Ed, <laughs> Ed, I apologize to you. You were called me, and I'm trying to rush to get this meeting started, and I didn't have time to talk. So no, it's okay. I cut no you problem. off, but I really need to get this going. I know. I was a day early yesterday, anyway. Okay. Your so, question? Yes. Well, a two-part question. One. Has anybody tried to use a T-Mobile cell spot? It's something for 3G, 4G, LTE service when you're in an apartment like I am at now, as opposed to a house, and you're on the opposite side of the building from where the cell tower is. Tom uh, O'Connor uh, is in such a boat. Uh, he lives in a condo. He's on the opposite side of where the cell tower is but he originally had an old uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, uh, phone. He uh, realized after uh, uh, I talked with him, he upgraded to a 5G. And it makes right. a big difference. And I have a five, two 5 gig phones. They're uh, iPhone 14s. But where I am, if I get, just go on the other side of the building, I get great coverage. But in my apartment, the irony of it is I got a T-Mobile uh, hotspot and it gets fairly decent signal, except to use the T-Mobile cell spot, you have to ensure that ports UDP 500, 4500, and 123 are open. And unfortunately, the T-Mobile Hotspot has those ports closed, and according to technical support, they can't open them. So I'm, I'm wondering if anybody has had the experience with that, and I'm working on trying to get something else. I talked to Sam for a little bit last night, and he suggested turning the problem back over to T-Mobile, but I was wondering if anybody had ever set up a T-Mobile hotspot. Cell spot, not a hotspot. No? Okay. The Why second thing is here, you're, you're, you're paving new ways for us. Yes. The second thing is I called you to ask you about, uh, and let me go back here, about the uh, a monitor that you said you liked. It's the TLC Roco TV. And it's, if you would tell me how to put, four pictures up i'll go through them real quickly in less than a minute or two okay if you go down to the bottom of your screen you should see share screen okay okay you click on that all right and then it'll bring up your screens if you have what you want to show us open look for it in the tile of windows and pick that window okay Uh, no, that's not. So what I pick was photos. Okay. Oh, then I go in here and pick photos. Maybe. Uh, it's not letting me. I'll I'll just walk through it. No. If do you have the pictures open? Yeah. Well. Open. Oh, one one at a time. You mean? No, you just need to open one, and then you should be able to, to use your arrow keys to go to the next window, next picture in your photo okay. viewer. Okay. Let okay. me try again. Share screen. I've got photos unknown. You have the photo open and up on I your screen? Have, it's open on my screen. Okay. It should be in the shared screen. It should appear in there. Okay. On the lower left side, on the left side. It says hold 
Shift key to select multiple windows. I don't want right. that. So, so pick the one that has the photos open on it. The photo, you should see it. Well, I don't. That's what I'm saying. I. Okay. All right. I, I could just walk through it. If all else fails, you could share your entire desktop. Okay. Okay. Sharing a desktop uh, may be easier because then he can open them up once the desktop is up. Okay. That's usually okay. the first square that represents the desktop. The uh, top uh, uh, left uh, uh, icon. Yeah, I, I tried that. I clicked on it and it you didn't work. On it. You click on it and then go down to the bottom right and click oh, and the share click button. Share. Okay. Okay. Let me try this other way. Photos, share, allows group, Zoom to share your screen, open system preferences. It says, want to allow different, okay, thank you, sorry. And it's not letting me do it. I'll just go through it. If anybody gets a TLC Roco TV, uh, and has a problem with the default settings, I'll tell you what to do. Anyway, you go into the, the, the Roco TV settings and you go to network. And then under network, you go to system. And under system, you go to about. And then under about, you go to power. And then there's a power on. And you can select which HDMI input you want to come in. And that will allow you to, to pick whichever one you want, like HDMI one or what, whatever it is you want. OK? So you've got the recording. You're recording at Stanford. So people should be able to do it. I can just run through it real fast again. Okay, you go through on, on your remote control for the TV, you hit settings and you pick network. After network, you when you're, you're in the system settings, then you go down and you pick power. When you pick power, there's a choice called power on. And when you click on, on that, then you can pick on which HDMI input you want to have come in. It's really buried quite far, and you wouldn't think power would mean power on, but that's how you find it. Okay. Sounds, sounds a lot like how my HDTV works. <laughs> and mine's a I lot only, older. <laughs> I only found it because the, the tech guy here where I'm living now said he remembered doing it, and it was buried real deep. So I went back over yeah. to my friend's place and found it. Yeah, you do have a problem. These things tend to be buried deep in the main use. <laughs> so the, if I recall, Ed, just so the group understands why you want to do that or why this needs to be done, the objective is, is by default, a TCL TV with Roku, when it turns on, it's going to default to the Roku screen, correct? Yes. Correct. Your friend has Comcast cable box. Yes. He wants it to go to the Comcast cable box first right. display screen, not the Roku splash screen. Exactly. That's the reason for changing the default boot up. Right. Okay. So hope that every that kind of clarifies for everybody on why what the objective was. And you know, some to me, I could see that as being an issue because I I thought about like the Roku TVs or any of them that have a Roku or something built in, but I don't want, I want to turn it on and I want it to turn on like a TV, just turn right. on the channel, whatever channel I had it left on uh, and not to run through the default screen and have to choose, you know, do I want streaming, do I want live TV, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I could understand that I could, and now that you found that, uh, but you said it only it changes the default HDMI input. Can you change it so it goes to straight TV? Yes. 
Okay. And you can change it to, it goes to the antenna also. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Thanks, Ed. Sure. Uh, next question, new direction. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a quick open forum. <laughs> we don't have any questions. I know uh, nobody's got a question. Nobody's got a problem. All right, Bob, you had something you wanted to throw. I had something. I had something interesting happen to me on the other PC when I was trying to identify the SSDs. I had forgotten. You see, this is my Intel NUC, and it had a failed OEM SSD. And I knew that one was a buy one and it identified itself as such. But the replacement they sent was a, a no name brand and I had forgotten which brand. So I went to identify it. And I also knew I had gotten an inland from Micro Center SSD. They both had an interesting thing happen. Let me share my screen so that you can see what was going on. Share screen, and I will share, I, it says screen, so I'll just share that. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now, and I will pull that down. And you guys are seeing my beautiful background, right? Right. Okay. So before, hey, can we, before Bob, can I interject something here? Yes. This is a brand new box that you got, a brand new PC. No, no, I, I'm talking about my existing NUC where this happened. Your existing NUC. Yeah. Okay. And the SSD failed on you. It had failed after less than a year. So it was RMA replaced. Got it. Okay. So you it got was that. a small internal OEM SSD. How did you know that it was it was failing or it just out like boom? Well, uh, this was the PC where I thought the whole PC had gone bad and it happened just before a daytime Zoom meeting. And I had to join that meeting on my Chromebook. And I, I, de I determined that at that point, I was never going to be without a backup PC for Zoom meetings again. So that's when I got the new PC. This is not about the new PC, which I'm using tonight. So tonight, I'm just going to demonstrate what I did and show you what it shows when it is functioning properly. This is Windows 11 22H2 Pro. Okay. And so they sent you a replacement SSD. Yes, they did. And, and it was an OEM SSD, okay. which was not really, it had no packaging. Uh, so it was not labeled as to what it was. And did they, I, didn't, I did not write down what was on the drive itself, the labels of the did parts. Did they offer to have it installed for you? I, I could have sent them the whole thing back and they wanted me to do that because they wanted to fix the thermal solution. Because on these NUX, adding a little bit more thermal solution often helps with problems with heat. Okay. I, I declined because I thought I would probably need this PC uh, sooner rather than later. And I could get myself in the interim uh, I, an SSD I could use in the meantime if I needed to. Uh, it turns out I got the new PC set up really quickly and I was able to use it for my next meeting, but that was not guaranteed. So I had bought this inland SSD and I wanted to identify A, which brand the OEM replacement SSD was. And I wanted to see if I could identify which SSD was the inland. They're different sizes, so it would be obvious. But I, here's what you normally would see in device manager for an SSD. You go to disk drives, open it up, and it says what they are. Samsung, Enclosure, WD Blue. In the enclosure, it's not going to identify what's in there, by the way. I, you go to details and you go to hardware IDs. And because it's an enclosure, it's not gonna tell you what's inside. That's normal. I can always take that apart and find out. 
But for the internal, it says WD Blue SN570, which is exactly what this is. Go to properties, details, drop down, hardware IDs, WD Blue, WD Blue. And also, I have inside the enclosure the Samsung. Oh, I have a second hard drive. I have a second SSD in here. This one has two SSDs. The NUC has only one. The second SSD is a Samsung SS970. You go to details, you go to hardware IDs, and it says seven Samsung SSD 970 Evo Plus. Well, these guys, the replacement drive said PCIe 3 SSD. And the driver said Microsoft. Nothing about who the manufacturer was or what the model was on either that or the inland. Neither one identifies itself. I ended up taking apart physically the NUC and the enclosure and identifying the drives. Here's what they are. The OEM replacement is labeled Fizon, which is a good Taiwanese company. And I, it said what kind of a Fizon it was. And I looked that up online and got the spec sheets for all these Fizon drives. And I, this one's low end, but it's a, Fizon is fairly decent regardless. And I looked in Tom's hardware and I got the information from them about it. I, so the bottom line is both Inland Prime and this drive are Fizon. Inland is Fizon under the hood. And it's Fizon that isn't identifying itself as Fizon. And uh, I think it's the controller that does the identifying. I, in Tom's hardware, it says that the Fizon I have, uh, that Simply Nook gave me, uses a controller that's called an E13. It's kind of long in the tooth, but it still works. I, the Inland Prime uses an E15 controller, which is better. If you had a gaming uh, SSD that needed PCIe 4 speeds, it would probably use a Fizon E19 controller. The E17, I guess, is obsolete. And so uh, there are these three grades of controllers and I got all the specs on the Inland Prime. Tom's Hardware likes Inland Prime as a brand. They think it's a good one. Uh, the memory in there is Micron and it's 3D TLC, uh, v VNAND flash memory, 176 layers, good stuff. And uh, it won't generate the tremendous amounts of heat that the fastest drives tend to generate. So everything's really nice. And there's a 250 uh, gigabyte drive. I, uh, yeah, 250 uh, gigabyte drive inside the NUC. And there's this 128 gigabyte replacement that's now sitting in a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure. So uh, the enclosure is fast enough. The Thunderbolt 3 is fast enough. The NVMe capabilities are being utilized. And it's just a little small for my data needs. So I'm getting something new. Okay, Sanford. Did they give you a bigger hard drive for your trouble? No, no, it's the same size. Did, same they, size. Extend, did they extend your warranty? Actually, Fison will honor the parts for five to six years. Okay. They, uh, they would, uh, Fison would allow a replacement. So if Simply Nuck wanted to be nice about it, they would have a five year warranty, but they definitely have a one year, no questions asked replacement policy. And that's how I got the replacement for the old one. Did you happen to run like a crystal mark uh, speed test on that SSD? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, crystal mark, I haven't run. Okay. I ran all the smart data, and Tom's Hardware has run uh, Crystal Mark on the Inland Prime, and uh, it's no speed demon, but uh, it's good enough. Uh, the throughput, 
on these drives is mostly limited by what you uh, attach it, if it's external, what you attach it to. In other words, my SATA 3 is limited to USB 3.0, five gigabit per second speeds. This uh, Thunderbolt 3 can go theoretically 20 gigabytes, uh, gigabits per second, but the SSD in there probably is not good for better than 10. So it's probably in practice about eight gigabits per second. I, and there's all kinds of other things about them. I being RAMless, no memory inside the SSD, it's going to have a really fast performance on the first few uh, megabytes of data, but then performance falls off seriously because there's no RAM on board and you'll, you'll get a slowdown. And then at steady state, the main draw of these SSDs is that they run cool compared with uh, some of the others that do have RAM. So it also it can use some of the system RAM as cache and all that. So that's all I needed to share from my desktop. I can stop sharing. Okay. And that's basically, I, I found out a lot of things about what these drives are and what they're capable of. And I'm actually more impressed now with that Fison replacement drive, even the little one, than I was initially. Initially, I thought they had replaced one no-name drive with another no-name drive, but this is not so. They replaced it with a fairly decent drive, not the best. And the one I got from Micro Center is uh, mid-grade. It'll probably serve me for five years or more. Sounds good. Now you got a five-year extension on your NUC. My NUC has, uh, well, my Skylake NUC, how long did it last? Six years before one of the gates went bad. Maybe Where is Micro Center? Micro Center, actually, Micro Center was founded in Cambridge, Massachusetts before they ever had a Chicago store. Well, where's the Chicago store? Westmont. In Ogden and, and Westmont. And okay. yeah, there's one downtown. Right. There's one downtown and, Chicago too. Right. The downtown right. Chicago was their first Chicago store. They have one in Cambridge, Mass, and they have one, I think, out in Burlington, Mass. Okay, it's been a long time since I've been there. I was so used to going to Fry's that I haven't been to Micro Center in a long time. Thank you. It's, it's another candy store. Right. <laughs> Rise is now. Well, yeah. But I mean, uh, <laughs> Micro Center is like another candy store. You go in there and just uh, make sure your credit cards got wide open, you know. That this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I you're, know you're what gonna, you mean. You're going to come out with a lot of goodies, you know. <laughs> or if, if you, yeah. If you and really I, want the, uh, the big yeah. store, uh, besides the Chicago one, you got to go to the Columbus, Ohio one, which I yeah. went to one time. And that's the monster. Well, it may be that our Cambridge, Massachusetts one is even bigger. There's a big one in St. Louis I was at last year. It's pretty big, much bigger than the one in Westmont. Wow. Yeah. I, as I recall, the one in Westmont didn't have anywhere near as much stuff as the one in Cambridge. But, oh. you know, it's not physically a larger store. It's just got everything crammed into tighter <laughs> spaces, like everything in Boston. <laughs> yeah. Well, Westmont's pretty packed, too. It is really packed. Yeah, that's a packed store. Yeah. Yeah. But uh -huh. uh, Micro Center or Micro Center Online are good places to get stuff. It's just usually Amazon will be cheaper. And I have ordered something a little bigger for the NUC and a new enclosure. Now, if memory serves me correctly, Micro Center used to be a mail order company. Uh, yeah, something on the scale of Newegg. However, there always was a physical store in Cambridge, Mass. If And also, if my memory serves me correctly, way back in the days gone by, that's where I used to get my um, my three and a half inch uh, drives and the labels for them. I used to order them all from them, disc drives, little floppy. Yeah. I used to get all my floppies from them yeah. and they had the labels that went on them. I used to buy those by the boatloads. Yeah, yeah. They go way back. They go way oh, yeah. back. 
they don't go quite as far back as Miller Micro out here, but uh, pretty far back. <laughs> okay, so Tom O'Connor is just catching up, is just logged in. Give him oh, a good. moment. Does he have an issue? Uh, no, actually, Ed was going to ask Tom a question. Ah, good. Tom's question could be pointed towards Tom. I'm sorry, Ed's question could be directed at Tom when Tom is ready. Tom, are you here yet? We're waiting for him. Okay, well, while he, Tom, are you there? All right, anybody else have any questions? I see a flash of video from Tom. He's coming in from uh, some other it universe. Is. So it takes a little while for all the particles to arrive. Yes, it does take a little while for those particles <laughs> to arrive. Martha's veneered. <laughs> well, uh, we had a little story about Martha's Vineyard <laughs> just a little while ago. <laughs> People arriving unexpectedly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, courtesy of uh, the governors of Florida and Texas and yeah. the soapbox. Uh, Tom, are you there? <laughs> uh, can you click on your audio and make sure it works? <laughs> Can't hear you, Tom. You're muted. Hit the mute button. Hit the space bar. Or click on the microphone. There. there. No, didn't hear him. Speak again, Tom. There. Something's Hit wrong. Hit the with microphone, that microphone button uh, to see if it's active or not. Nope. Nope. Go down to microphone on the left. Click the up arrow carrot and make sure. Is that where we got to do it? Test our microphone. Um, uh, uh, on your headset, check the button for the microphone to make sure it is on. The other thing I do if all else fails is unplug the plug from the computer and put it back in. Ah, Wayne's coming in. Not yet, Tom. Speak, Tom. Say something. One, two, three. Nope, nothing. No, nah, not yet. Not yet. Tom, um, check the headset button. He did. He's plugged in. All right. Then you need to go down to the... Uh, microphone on the left hand side and it says test speaker and microphone maybe he's going to unplug this well say good night mike wayne are you there okay who'd we lose we just lost somebody I, yes i'm here um, ah good good job wayne you got in yeah, thank you. Okay. A bit slow. Yeah, uh, Sanford, we lost <laughs> Tom again. I'm sorry? We lost Tom again. We um, lost Tom again. Well, I see him, but I just don't hear anything from Tom O'Connor. I see video from Wayne. Good job, Wayne. Well, the other thing you can check is whether your system is recognizing your headphone. Yeah. Yeah, that's go through the headset. the headset. Someone want to walk them through this? On my taskbar, I have a little gold microphone, uh, which is to on my uh, Windows 11, it's to the right of where I would see my external drives. Well, you got gold, I've got a, a turquoise. Uh, uh, OK, it depends on your background. It's a microphone. And there's also the speaker. Yeah, it's uh, uh, to the uh, right of uh, uh, your uh, network connection uh, uh, indicator and the uh, speaker on your sys tray on the taskbar. 
you should see a microphone icon before the up uh, uh, carrot. Uh, uh, it's an up arrow. Uh, if you've got the uh, the microphone there, it should work unless you've got it muted in the settings. For that, you have to go over to the microphone on Zoom, bottom right side. There's an up arrow. If you click that, it opens up a menu. And check your microphone. Uh, uh, it may be muted. Tim, on my Zoom, that's bottom left. Excuse me, bottom left. You're right. Bottom left. Far bottom left corner. Yeah. Microphone. And when you speak into it, if it's working, you should be getting a little green floating up and down. Is that working? Nope. Nope. No, we still don't hear anything from Tom. So let's keep moving forward till Tom figures this out. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, Wayne, did you have any questions that you'd like to pose uh, to the group? Uh, let me think a bit. Let you think a bit. I like that. All right. Um, has anybody, uh, oh, did, did anybody buy anything I, lately at Prime Day that they just got and installed and they want to tell us about? Even question. though that was back in September. Whenever you're available, I got a question. Okay, go ahead, Wayne. Okay, I installed Windows 11 on my machine, and I wanted to increase the size of the text, and I also wanted to increase the size of the the icon. Uh, the, what do you call that on the screen? The icon. The icon. Yeah. Is that possible to do? I believe that's appearance. Yeah, or uh, you can go into uh, systems display and change the percentage from 100% to like 125 or 150. That's called scaling. You can do yeah. that. Uh, Tim, okay. Tim, you want to bring up your share screen and show Wayne how to do this on your screens? Yeah, show us. Yeah, show us. Can you hear me now? You're muted, Tim. Yes, Tom, we heard you. Okay. Hi, Tom. Hi. <laughs> I was set for the wrong type of microphone. Sorry about that. I'll start up now. Okay. Good job. I thought it was something like that. <laughs> now you know. You became smarter today. No, yes. Stupid, stupid, do, you but guys, okay. do you uh, guys see my screen? We, oh, see, yeah. we see your icons on the bottom and a scrolling mouse thing. Okay. Nothing else. No dust Last pointer. That's uh, that's fine uh, uh, because I have a black uh, background. Okay. Uh, I'm coming down to the uh, start uh, button. Uh, it's still called that on all versions of Windows. I click that. I bring it up to settings. Settings comes up. And you're already in systems. Here's display. I click display. And uh, uh, down here, it says scale, 100%. I can change that to 125, 150, 175. Uh, usually, uh, uh, 125 is enough for most people, but you might have to go 150. The other thing that uh, uh, Bob uh, Premick was uh, talking about, you uh, can go into accessibilities. You can change just the text size, visual uh, uh, effects, uh, the mouse pointer or touch uh, uh, screen, text cursor size. You can turn on a magnifier. Uh, that takes getting used to. Uh, those are the main things in changing uh, your appearance of uh, desktop icons and text. There's so one other. Say you only wanted to increase it by five or ten percent. Uh, that, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is not uh, uh, available uh, uh, in the norm. If I right-click on my desktop, 
I can go to the display settings, but it takes me right back into the regular settings. It's not independent like it used to be. So unfortunately, the only other thing you can change is display resolution. That's a possible option also. If I click that little down arrow, these are all the possibilities from 800 and 600 uh, uh, pixels, which is super large uh, uh, display text and icons, all the way to, uh, I have a 1080p card in the machine. And uh, uh, that's what I'm at right now. But I can use these other settings in between, try them out, they're temporary. Uh, uh, if now, you find the size you want, then you say, I want to keep it. Okay. I, one other thing you can do just for the desktop icons, the desktop icons can be changed under theme. Oh. There are theme settings that allow you to that's do a, icon size, and there are four different sizes you can choose. Three or that's four. under person, uh, 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 personalization. Personalization, yeah, yeah. And here's your themes. And once you go into themes, you got a uh, uh, background color, uh, uh, you got sounds, your mouse cursors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's your various themes. These are backgrounds, etc. Desktop icon settings. If I click on that little icon, it shows me some of the things I can put onto the desktop. I can change the type of icon I have representative, but uh, it does not really allow me to change the size of them, at least not on this one. Uh, I think you can, in the default, change the icon size. Let me check and see whether it's easy to find. I have a question about icons. Not allowed. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, ahead, Tom. What's your question? <laughs> okay, yeah. I, what I'd like to do is uh, alter my panel, the icon, the main icon panel of the screen, so I have things in some type of an order, so it's easy to find. And when I try to move them around, they always jump back to where they were. That's called a uh, uh, auto uh, uh, configuration. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, a feature that can be turned off. I haven't explored it in eleven. Uh, Hang on a minute. Uh, shoot. I am placing in chat, make use of, and it has five different ways to set icon size. Uh, offhand for Tom, uh, 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 I know uh, uh, what you're talking about. Uh, uh, it's an auto arrangement uh, feature in uh, uh, Windows going way back. And uh, some people didn't like it because of exactly what uh, uh, you specified, Tom, that it uh, keeps moving things around. Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. I see it. You can turn I, it. If I can share my desktop, I can show you in the I'll context. Get out. In the context menu, I can show you how you do this. Okay. I let me get to where I am sharing. Let me break you guys up. Share screen, hold desktop, share, and any right click, view, large icons, medium icons, or small icons, auto arrange, align to grid, and show desktop icons. Now, what, what did, how did you get that? What? Right click in Windows On 11. Desktop. In Windows 11, it's just a right click. And right, right up at the top. top right on, up at on the, the uh, desktop, right? Yeah, any blank spot on the desktop. Now, one more thing. Is there any chance of being able to change the, the text size on, on the ribbon for Excel? That is a Microsoft Office setting. And uh, I believe you can personalize Office as well. Okay. Gotcha. You, can you can theme Office and you can personalize it. 
Gotcha. Okay. Thank and then again, uh, this is also the right click on the desktop. We'll also bring you up to personalize, which Jim shows us. Gotcha. All kinds of things you can do. And different themes will have different visibility and different uh, uh, icon sizes and fonts. Gotcha. So you can choose Thank different you. themes. Gotcha. There's a lot of things you can do. Mm -hmm. Sanford has a question. Well, actually, I wanted to add to this, and Tim, you illustrated this, but you, you kind of went over it kind of quickly. Um, and that is when Windows installs itself on a new machine or any new PC you get these days, they always set it up to the maximum resolution Correct. that that device can handle. In right. Tim's case, he was going, uh, what is it, 1920 by 1024 something like that or 1960 by 1024 yeah that made his icons very small by changing that resolution to uh what was it there was 1280 by 10 by 1024 you're still having a 1080p if you want to think about it that way resolution but yeah. your fonts and your icons will all be much bigger and that would be the first place that i would go personally before I start messing around with font sizes and anything else, yeah. I would change the resolution because I've always found that um, the default resolution was always set to the highest point. And it's almost like they're doing it like Apple does because they gear the stuff towards younger people who have better eyes than us. <laughs> and those people, those younger people appreciate the small icons and the small fonts. Well, older ones, Older people who've been around the block 20 times, <clears throat> we want a bigger size font so, and icons. That would be my suggestion first, Wayne, yeah. is change your default resolution. <coughs> do you gotcha. like that? Screen gotcha. resolution. <clears throat> Screen yeah, resolution. You, you, you do not need that high resolution. The other thing I change every time I see it, if I can, everybody's going for these dark themes that you're supposed to look at in a blackened out room and it's supposed to be like your phone and uh, it's easy for gamers to see, but it's not easy for older people to see. Right. Now, so I we, go always over to a light theme. Also, if I may add, when you change that screen resolution, that should also change the font size in Excel. Right. So oh, your really? screen display in Excel and any program you open will be larger by changing the screen resolution. By lowering no. it down a few notches will make things bigger. Screen Tom, resolution is global. Yeah, global. Right. It's a global setting. Tom Saltis, did you have something you wanted to add? Tom, we can't hear you. Unmute, please. There you go. Anytime I've wanted a larger font size, all I do is control plus. You know, hit that you no know, once, twice, three times, and you get the size font that you want. That's zooming in and zooming out. Uh, if you use Does that font. stay that way? Yeah. Or do you have to do it every time you want it? You're gonna have to that does not it stay the way. It changes all the time. I would change your resolution first. Start yeah. there. Okay. Okay. Now, Getting to uh, the resolution, uh, you said you right click on the desktop and pick up uh, image settings or what the hell? The hell is it? Uh, display settings? Display, display settings. settings. What are you looking for? He wants to change uh, his resolution. Display right. settings uh, and scroll down if necessary to where you see uh, uh, screen resolution. Gotcha. Okay. You could do that right Good. now, Wayne. This is real easy to do. Uh, All right. Tell, tell us what it's saying. It. All right. Let's see. By the way, what Tom was saying about Control Plus, that only works inside of a web browser. Yes. I and in some applications. Right. It does not well, do it, it desktop. It works in my email, too. Yeah. Email is what? Uh, in a client? Yeah, right. it's Comcast. Again, it's an application. It's not your desktop. Comcast email is webmail. Yeah. Webmail means you're uh, going through the browser no matter what. Right. 
Yeah, so, so it will uh, it, it will work there. I'm running in 1920 by 1080. Okay, okay. so take Drop it down a, a, a couple right. notches. Try Wait. 760, 768 by 992 is the next one. No, go but down no, right. one more. I think it's 1280 by 1024. Try that one. Wow, that's a that's a hell of a jump. Okay, no, it's no, not. It, no, it's that, not. That's going from uh, full HD down to HD quality, 720p. Okay, now it says keep these display settings. It's showing you what it looks like size wise, and there's a button there that says keep it if you like it. Otherwise, it times out. And goes back to the uh, setting it was. Mm -hmm. So when the icon changes on the screen, the text under it also changes. That's right? correct. Everything changes. The whole perspective of what you're looking at on the screen changes permanently for everything. All right. Now, if I did that, would that affect the uh, the quality of the picture in a graphics program? Not, not noticeably, not noticeably. No, okay. it, it's changing how much you can see at a time per se, uh, because uh, with less resolution, you see less real estate on your screen. At the so setting nice. that you already had, you see the most you're gonna see on that screen. If you had gotcha. a 4K display, you would see four times as much as what you're seeing right now but it also would be very, very small compared to what uh, it is uh, in the default setting you had. And if you did turn it way up, you would see a lot more, but what you would see is pretty much empty space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, also going back to those uh, icons and trying to arrange them, uh, I, do, I do that, no, no, for, you know, fairly often to change what I want it you know, to be. But all you have to do is right click and do refresh and they'll stay. They'll stay where you put them. Hmm. Yeah, you can rearrange, you can auto arrange, you can arrange to grid. There's lots of things you can do by way of arranging. But what we're trying to do right here is get everything the right size and get all the, all the fonts readable and make sure that everybody's comfortable. These things that are now called, that have been called accessibility features, mm -hmm. they actually are things that are not aimed at disabled people or blind people or anybody like that. They are features that started in those communities, but are now getting to be very mainstream. I was just reading an article in Windows Secrets about that. Yes, uh, uh, I use uh, uh, the accessibilities, uh, uh, mouse cursor all the time to enlarge it uh, because the uh, standard controls are so lame. It, at least uh, uh, within accessibilities for the uh, mouse pointer, I have total adjustability. So I can put it the way I want it. Yeah, and that accessibility pointer where you can make the mouse pointer big, it works very well when you're trying to demonstrate something. All right. Right. When I was changing the resolution, I was looking at screen number two, and here I saw no change in the icon. I figured out what the hell was I doing? But when I looked over on screen number one, it did change the icon and the text, et cetera. That's thank you. Thank you very much. There you go. Look at Wayne, he's rocking two screens tonight. Yeah. Well, I just find it so much easier to do so when you got to. I just bought, I just got them today, two new uh, 24 inch screens. Well, Wayne, uh, uh, when you're using dual monitors or three monitors or four monitors, each monitor is its own separate animal. So the uh, change you made on screen one for the resolution, you have to go do the same thing on screen two, three, four. I okay that that's an important bit of information. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now I can see what the hell is going on. There's also the ability to uh, when you're in the screen settings, you could have it identify your monitor so you know which one you're uh, dealing with when you're changing something. 
Hmm. All right, uh, we're gonna circle back to Ed, who had a question for Tom O'Connor. Which question did I have? <laughs> well, that to do, your question had to do with your T-Mobile hotspot. Oh, not, not so much my T-Mobile hotspot, my T-Mobile cell spot. Go ahead. And Tom, did, do you happen to have a T-Mobile cell spot? I, no, I don't know what T-Mobile cell spot is. Oh, well, what's, okay. what are you using? I thought you were using a T-Mobile spot. I use a hell, the hotspot for T-Mobile. Hotspot. Yes. It, right. It's a, a tethering feature on the cell phone to connect uh, to a computer uh, for Wi-Fi internet support. And you're using right. something different, right, Ed? No, I, I'm using both. I'm using the T-Mobile hotspot to give my internet. But unfortunately, they have those ports blocked that I was trying to, to use the T-Mobile cell spot to improve my LTE signal which is poor. That's why I want to do it. But I, I thought, if, can someone correct me? Isn't LTE going bye bye? No, not LTE. Not. LTE what? will be around a while. A but LTE while. is like uh, version three, isn't it? No, 4G LTE. 4G right. LTE. Okay. Yes. And, and, and that's what I, I have. That. I have that. It's going to be around a while. LTE ca carried over from three to four, and I think probably will continue again next time, too. So. Yeah, it started with three, but it went to four, and it, it is not part of 5G because 5G does things completely differently. Exactly. So th maybe somebody can help me with this one. Ed was saying that his problem is, and the saying that Tom is, He's on the opposite side of a building from the cell tower. Yes. But cells are designed so that if you can't reach one, you should be able to reach another. I'm on the why opposite it, side Why of does both. this matter? Because I'm on the opposite side of both. Of both? Right. I'm on the opposite side of the LTE tower, and I'm on the opposite side of the 5G tower. Yeah, I that can happen. <laughs> it can happen. And one thing that I am, I'm on the opposite side of the, the 5G tower. However, I'm quite close to it. So even though I'm on the opposite side, the signal still gets through because it's a strong signal and I'm within a good range. So it may cut it in half, but it's still powerful. I uh, There's something else to consider about 5G. Uh, the signal is not uniform. It is a shaped signal, beam formed. Beam forming allows one area to have a concentrated signal and 10 feet away, you might not have any. Oh, yeah, okay. 5G well, is also kind of short range, uh, especially when in crowded building areas. I, it depends, urban 5G, you're correct. But there's a rural 5G, which is a uh, low band. And it has miles and miles of range, but it does not penetrate structure as well. Well, in my case, uh, I am the the only structure in between the tower and the building. I can say there are other uh, homes and such, but I'm in a two-story building and nothing is in the way. Uh, sure, there's a tollway between us, but that is not gonna meet a two-story building. And when I look out the eastern side of the building, I'm on the west side, but I want to look out the eastern side of the building, you can see the uh, the noise wall on 294 and the tower stands up about two stories above that. And I'm on a two story building, so it's still at least a story and a half higher in a direct line of sight. So, even if it's uh, weakened, it's still getting to me well. Yeah, uh, they probably also are forming the beam so that it's pretty strong your direction. 
and yeah. I, so they're trying to favor you and your neighborhood. Of course, according to my phone, uh, a five bar marker, I'm always getting, uh, well, not always, but 99% of the time I get four bars. Yeah, you've got a good signal. Yeah. Uh, now you now try being in the Boston area where we've got hills everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, my, and my problem is that I get one bar and sometimes even though I have one bar, I call T-Mobile and they, I choose the option for them to call me back. And when they call me back, my phone doesn't pick it up, even though it's a, a iPhone 14, brand new phone, it doesn't pick it up and it goes to voicemail. And I get this voicemail that says, push one if you're ready to talk to us or, you know, we'll, we'll try calling you back again. And it, it's super frustrating. All I need to do is get this cell spot to work. Yeah. It should give me four bars. I, yeah, except for one thing. If you're indoors, cell signals get blocked by building materials. I understand, but, but what they do is they take advantage of the internet connection to provide additional signal to give you a remote trans okay. transmitter. As long as you've got certain ports open. Right, exactly. Tom? Okay, I have a suggestion <laughs> for you. You can get a map or put together a map online. <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, when I was having quite a few problems because they had trouble with that tower that I'm working on, uh, with the map I made of the towers, I could see what was 5G, what was 4G. I ended up asking what I could do about it. And they said that they could uh, get the SIM card uh, reprogrammed without bringing the phone in to work with 4G towers better. And since I had the map, I could put the phone sitting it in the window of my room rather than on my desk, have it sit in the window five feet away from me, and I could get uh, a full four or five bar signal off of a 4G tower in the opposite direction. So, Make yourself a map of what the area is like around you, and maybe it would be better to get a, a weaker signal, the 4G instead of the 5G, because the 4G has a, a wider range signal on it than the 4G does, like we've been saying. It's a stronger signal, but it's a tighter signal, so less distance. The 4G has a much longer distance. That's, so, that's a good that's a good suggestion, Tom. And if, and if I can't, if I can't get this cell spot to work, I'll try that. Yeah, and and they could do it. I didn't have to go into the office and have them swap cards on me. They could do it for me by phone. You know, they could do right. the well, thing. I my SIM card is an electronic SIM card, so they could change that. Yeah, same thing here. They could change that, and I knew where the towers were, so. I could just do it perfectly. I, I'm on the, the west side window and I just, just stuck it in the window so I wouldn't have any problem. And, you know, it, it didn't need to hard wire it to anything. Just, st you know, it set it up there and no problem at all. Yeah, my problem is that my building is exactly north south. The one 5G cell tower is northeast of me. I mean, my my apartment is south and west and if oh. and i know exactly where the other tower is and it's directly east of me so i have other buildings and other apartments in between me and there and i'm on the first floor and it's a three-story apartment oh yeah so you've got a lot of buildings against you there are a lot of walls yes in my, in my case i have uh, probably, I'll say two and a half walls because one is mostly windows, the outer wall on the, the far side. The two walls would be the hallway uh, between me and the other building, you know, the other condominium. So, you know, it's a pretty heavy duty wall, but it's not an outer wall. So, I, I, I went to an apartment just 
down the hall from me that faces south and west. And I was in there today helping a person with an electrical problem, just resetting the breaker, and I got a terrific signal. And it was only 50 feet away. But it's the building in between that's the problem. They'll put Jarrett's butt in their apartment. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you move? <laughs> Tell yeah. them you, there's a problem. You stay, the apartment you're in stinks or smells. It's got a bad aroma or something. <laughs> Tell them to give you one on the other side. It's brand new. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's a That's VOCs right. are bothering you, giving you a headache. It's also sold out. Yeah. Oh, well. You know what? Uh, you know what they're introducing around uh, my area, at least for uh, TV, uh, for the 5G, is uh, a system called Starry. Where if they get a building to sign up, uh, the building has an antenna, and the receiver is for the whole building, hmm. and everybody gets the same. And and I'm work I'm on the communications committee, and we're working on that, on upgrading our our Wi-Fi system, so that would solve my problem also. Yeah, now Starry isn't everywhere, but there's some places some places around Boston that have it. Is T-Mobile offering an in-house or uh, is T-Mobile offer an in-house repeater like Sprint used to? Yes, and that's what it is. It's a T-Mobile cell spot. Okay, and it's just, it's just like what Sprint used to. The other question I guess I do have: I have a Pico Station M2 HP, and what it is, it's a for people like in farms and places like that. I may be able to to connect it up so that I have an ethernet connection to the local, not through my T-Mobile, but my uh, apartment complex Wi-Fi system. And so if this other thing doesn't work, I'm gonna try that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any last questions before we go to our presentation tonight? Yes, Tony. Yes. I'm 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 confused with all these things, you know, with that stuff. I don't understand that you have Wi-Fi and T-Mobile or whatever it is. Let me tell you what I have. My internet comes in through um fiber optic cable into my house. Okay. Comes in underground. And then when I get inside now. I have a router from T-Mobile or Comcast or Xfinity or somebody, and I spread the juice around the house and I don't have a problem. Okay. So if you have to go to, directly to the towers outside of your building, outside of your area, that is like you're in the street. I mean, are you in the road, you're paying taxes, are you? Yeah, Tony, uh, fiber optic is the best of all the worlds. It yeah. has uh, equal upstream and downstream, and I, it is the fastest and the most stable, but it's not available everywhere. And I might add, Tony, you're in a single family dwelling residential. Ed is in, is in an apartment building oh. with mm. a shared internet access. Oh. So they got one pipeline coming in and they're sharing it throughout the whole building. What are you trying to say? Previous conversation from Ed, it sounds like they had a really terrible feed coming into them, a low quantity bit rate or whatever they have, or megabits, shall I say. And yeah. that feed shared amongst everybody is overtaxing it. It's uh -oh. kind of like putting 20 units on a DSL line. DSL barely works for one person. So I don't know. That. Right, Ed? Isn't that what, what they got going on? Yes. What's your dong speed? How many, how many megabits you get? Okay. On my... T-Mobile hotspot, which mm -hmm. cannot communicate with the T-Mobile cell spot, I'm getting anywhere from 150 to 200. And that's great for my- That's internet. it? That's good. <sighs> yes, <sighs> for, 30, for $30 a month. You still but, my heart. Oh, geez. They just right. upgraded T-Mobile, not T-Mobile, um, Comcast just upgraded me from, I used to get two, 250 about a year ago to put me up to 400. At the beginning of this year, they put them up to six, and yesterday they put them up to eight hundred for the same price. I think they're going to be pushing a megabit just now, a gigabit. Yeah, I, but, again. But the local net, the local network that I have, mm -hmm. I'm getting eight megabit download 
Yeah. And sometimes, on a rare occasion, two megabit upload. Oh, good poor thing. All right. That's why yeah. he's you, okay. he can't use that service. Right. That's why I can't understand. All right. Now I am. Uh, okay. Let me get back to Martha's Vineyard here, where we have the things going on. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Now I understand. I feel sorry for you guys, but I can't help. You. <laughs> yeah. I fiber optic has a lot better capacity than mm -hmm. by copper wire cable and it has a lot better characteristics if you distribute it yep it yeah. sounds like the when the building planners were working out the building the internet was an afterthought it and wasn't they just said oh we'll just have somebody bring it in and whatever is the cheapest yeah. is what we'll do and this no, that, that's not the case in 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 my new building they have fiber optic over to this building but they have not increased the speed and i'm working on the committee i have a meeting with the person that's working with the company to do that next week they just haven't increased the speed yet but they've been working on that they are saying they're going to do it for over a year now uh okay so it's a question of getting the right committee to do the right thing i uh, yes. because uh where i live each apartment gets its own feed and we have a choice of either fiber optic or traditional cable. And that's what we were supposed to do. But when we tried to do it, nobody, the company was uh, um, taken over by uh, dig, single digit. <laughs> and when you call them, you get good technical support, but nobody in sales will ever call you back. <laughs> oh, OK. Okay. I good story for you guys. Get your tax money back refund. <laughs> yeah. yeah, get a bird and attach a piece of paper and fly it in. Yep. Yeah, hey, I'm sorry. Anybody else got anything they wanted to add to this subject here? No. Okay, yeah. let's go to our presentation tonight. Uh, Wayne, would you like to take over? Yeah, let me let me try and see if I can get on share screen here. And you got your PowerPoint open? Yeah. Okay. Right here. We got it. I want to I want to put it on to uh force it to do the uh So it shows without all the individual ones. I can't, I got this thing up at the top. Anyone want to help them with this? Is it the TV screen up in the bar at the top? I got a bar up at the top, a black bar, and I can't get to the menu on uh, where I want to do the- uh... Grab a hold of that black bar and pull it down. It there should be pullable. And you can pull it all the way down to your taskbar. There we go, slideshow. Uh, yeah, it's slideshow. Yeah, and then it's got a choice of uh, custom slideshow. There we go. No, don't want that. There we slide go. Slideshow starting at the first slide. There we go. Can everybody see this? You're good. Okay. Now, last last year, uh, last August 2021, I gave a presentation on uh, my Tesla Model S that I had uh, leased in uh, 2019. And uh, this is one of the things I, I, I think everybody's pretty familiar now with the different terminology, ICE, which is internal combustion engines which we've had for over 100 years. Then we've got the hybrid, which is gasoline and electric. And now, and then there's the plug-in hybrid, which is runs on gasoline and electric. And uh, that you can actually charge it. You know, you can do it with either level one or level, level two. Now, is everybody familiar with level one, two, and three charging? Why don't you go ahead and tell us? Okay, level one 
is like your 120 volt AC. It's pretty slow charging, which you can do on, on just about all, all the cars that, that have a plug-in, all the electric cars or the plug-in hybrids can all charge at, at level one and level two. <laughs> the, uh, the big cars that, such as Tesla, they can charge at level three. Level three is uh, 440 volt AC, uh, DC. So it charges directly into the uh, into the battery, where the level one uh, it has to have a transformer in it that converts it up to DC, and in, in at the 440 volts or whatever they got. I think the uh, Lucids are up to like 900 volts DC. So anyway, then level two charging is is a 240 volt AC that gets converted to the DC. Okay, so the PHEV is a plug-in hybrid, and then the EV, which is the all electric, and that's what, what I had, I had a Tesla, which is an, uh, considered an EV. Okay, so as I said, I leased this for three years. It was uh, only a 75 kilowatt battery. They're all now 100 kilowatt. But because this was uh, rated at 254 miles, when I want to try to travel very far, you know, there was always this range anxiety that you'd run into because you had to figure out where am I going to stop, where am I going to charge, and, and of course, it's not an instant charge either. It takes takes a couple hours. What? <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the other thing was my wife. Uh, didn't enjoy traveling in in this. It's uh, not the smoothest riding car. Uh, and the other thing she didn't like was a high tech feature because all the adjustments were had to had to be made on the screen. Uh, on that Tesla that I had, uh, there were only two buttons on the whole dash: one button for the uh, emergency flashers, the other for the glove, you know, the glove box. So all the adjustments uh, were made on the screen. The other thing is during that three years, I had 77 software updates. And the practical range that I was able to achieve was probably at the most 200 miles because you never run, you never want to run your battery down to zero because if you do that, you can, you can destroy the battery. Okay, so I decided at the end of this three year lease, I, I was not going to extend this. I uh, wasn't going to go for another test. The technology was getting uh, up more changes. It was, of course, a lot more expensive now. So I decided I wanted to go into a, a plug-in hybrid. And so as a result of that, I decided, I decided to start looking uh, on the internet, looked at uh, YouTube videos and various different things uh, to try to find out what, what the best uh, plugins might be. The consensus that uh, I came up with was that the Toyota RAV4 Prime the plug-in hybrid uh, was a recent new product and it had the highest range of those uh, reasonably priced automobiles. Uh, with the Toyota reliability is when this was then the choice of the new car. And the range that they were they were claiming was was uh, around forty to fifty miles. Uh, some of these various different plug-in hybrids have a range of anywhere from thirteen miles, you know, fourteen, twenty, whatever it is. The Toyota Rav4 Prime had I, I have say, seen people report as high as sixty miles on all their electric. So then, as a result of pricing of used vehicles. Uh, this last summer that was inflated when my uh, lease was up on my Tesla, instead of turning it in, I decided I was going to buy it out. And uh, I was able to buy my Tesla out and then turn around and sell it for a heck of a lot more than what I had put, uh, paid. And then I started looking to check into the Toyota dealers to find about, uh, you know, find one of these RAV4s that was available. Unfortunately, 
<laughs> there's hardly in any that I could find in this area. Uh, the problem was uh, most of the Toyota uh, plug-in hybrids are being delivered to the, the West Coast or the East Coast in basically the states that are, that are considered green. And, uh, but I did find a Toyota dealer here in the, in the local area that had a used RAV4 Prime. So I took my wife for a test drive. She, she liked it. it uh, it's very nice riding. I had a lot of good drivability features. So at the end of the test drive, uh, salesman said, oh, I've got a, um, a RAV4 Prime coming in. It's, uh, that's been allocated to us and uh, expect it to some time within a month or so. So we ended up uh, putting out down a small uh, thing on this and we decided instead of What's going on? Hello? I put uh, put a for sales, uh, put this for sale out on Facebook, and I got several interested people, but uh, mainly they were car dealers. I ended up negotiating a sale uh, to a car dealer, which was probably about the amount that I was able to sell over and above uh, what uh, what they were asking because they had a big markup. Uh, that pretty much took care of what I was able to sell the Tesla for over and what I, I, I paid for. So I negotiated a sale with a, the local uh, car dealer and uh, I turned that in and uh, got the check, uh, deposit the next day. And that uh, evening I got a call from the uh, Toyota dealer telling me that the RAV4 uh, was uh, unloading that evening and I could take delivery the next day, which we did. So I've, I've taken this uh, RAV4 on an extended drive to Ohio and back, and I had no range anxieties. Uh, roughly, I can get about 50 miles uh, on all electric, and I can get uh, over 500 miles on, uh, on the gas, you know, in the hybrid mode. So uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, considerably less range anxiety. And what I enjoy is that I can drive around. Most of the time I'm driving around town, so I never end up using gas. Uh, the other thing was the uh, Tesla charger that I'd had put into my garage, 240 volt AC that I had in the garage. Uh, uh, you know, the Tesla has a, a different type of plug on, on all their chargers than, than what all the rest of the cars are. But I was able to buy a, uh, an adapter that fit on that and it plugs right into my, into my uh, Toyota. So I was able to make use of the charger that I had installed in my garage. So this is an example of one of the searches that I did on the uh, on the internet, uh, they rated the Toyota RAV4 Prime uh, as a 10 out of 10. And as you can see, it's very, they had a couple trim packages. The one that I ended up with had the, the, the extended uh, trim package. Now they came with two different uh, ratings on the uh, transformer. One of them was, uh, uh, would take you know six or eight hours to charge. And the one that I've got, I can charge mine up in about two and a half hours on the 240 volt. Uh, it's a four cylinder uh, gas engine. It's got an 18 kilowatt battery. Interesting thing is that they do not use <laughs> all of the battery for uh, for running on all electric they keep part of that 
to be used as the uh, hybrid. In other words, you know, with a hybrid car, they have a, a battery in there and, and the battery gets charged by regenerative braking. That's, that's how they get charged. So the, uh, this RAV4 Prime has got a, a combined horsepower, 302 horsepower. And, you know, here again with an electric uh, automobile, you know, it's got pretty instant torque. And of course this has instant torque as well. This is, this is uh, the picture of my Prime, which was uh, the, the, the XSE version, which was a, the best high, high, highest version that they put out with the, the highest uh, transformer for converting uh, the AC to DC. And this is an example of what the dash looks like. As you can see, the other day when I got through charging, it showed I could, I could run 49 miles on all electric I could drive. I'd already driven a few miles on, on the uh, on the gas. Uh, in fact, today we drove uh, drove quite a bit, 20, 30 miles today out and back. The other interesting thing, what I do is I drive on. Come on. Drive on EV in in town. And then when I get out on the highway, I hit the, the thing and I can convert it, you know, switches over to uh, uh, hybrid, which is using the gas. Because when you're out on the highway doing 60, 80 miles an hour, it really chews the battery up really quick. So that's, uh, and you can see here, what it does is when, when you put push on the brake, it actually charges back into the battery and it does not use the, the brake pads until it gets down to the point where it can't charge anymore. So it's rather interesting when you come to a stop, it's sort of a quick jerk when you get, when it switches over from uh, electric braking to the actual uh, brake pads. The other thing that's very interesting is this, when this switches over between the gas you know, between the electric and, and, and the gas, you can't even tell. It's just, it's, it's seamless when it goes either way. You know, you're, if you're running on all electric and you run out of the electric and it switches over to gas, you don't even know when it switches over. It's, you can't even feel it. So that's pretty much uh, my, my comments. Uh, Anybody else uh, have any questions? I, I'll try to answer them. Wayne, I sent you a couple in the chat. Can you read those to, and just come back to me with that? Hang on, let me get to the chat here. Let me, okay. Uh, the dealer that I worked with, which what, in terms of what? When I sold my, my Tesla or? No, when you purchased. Uh, you don't was, have to share that to the group. I'm just asking you. Oh, okay. Well, it was it was a local dealer here in 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 the area here. Yes, I did pay a premium over the sticker. Oh, you did. Oh. <laughs> more than more than five. Oh yeah. Wow. They. Okay. Well, it's it's like I said, it's. Uh, it's very, very difficult to find these cars. Is it possible to just order the car and then pay sticker? No, not, not a, not a, uh, a plug-in hybrid. Okay. If you wanna buy a, a hybrid or just a regular uh, RAV4, I'm sure you can. Okay. But uh, if you go on the internet, I, I, uh, I've been on the internet with, uh, on, on Facebook, on the uh, RAV4 Prime uh, with the uh, Facebook and people all over the whole whole U.S. There's a few of them that have been able to get uh, buy them at uh, sticker price, but those are probably on the East Coast. Out on the West Coast, uh, 
and uh, many other places it's it's way above sticker price and the other thing is now it, it seems that a lot of the uh, dealers aren't aren't selling to anybody out of out of state in other words people have been buying cars like i've i've seen somebody had bought a car that lived in washington state and bought a car from a dealer in new york you know you know and i've seen a lot of people buy cars you know like from texas uh, bought one on the east coast but like i said most of the dealers are being uh, this is all allocated and you don't have a choice you can't just order what you want toyota just makes these cars and sends them out to to the dealer and you get what you get so i didn't have a choice as to what color or, or any of the options that, that, that's the way it came wayne could you lease this car i could have but I, I decided no, I I, I wasn't going to lease it because I'll probably keep this. The reason I lease the Toyota, I mean the Tesla, is because with the technology changing so rapidly, uh, and is you know I just didn't didn't want to be stuck with with something like that. Wayne, does it have self steering? Yes. On, on the highway. Yeah. It. Uh, it's it's uh, when I put it in in uh, cruise control, it'll steer. But I, if I don't hang onto the steering wheel, it'll beep at me just like my Tesla did. You you got to right. keep your hands on the wheel, but you right. can take them off for a while. But it steers. Do you get much? Do you get much ping pong effect? Get what? Ping pong effect where it, where it goes to the right until it sees the line. And then it's no, just it, it, it goes it goes a little bit back and forth. It's it's not not that much, but not, you know, not when objectionable. I, when I'm hanging on to it, I can feel it trying to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it'll stay. It it'll what it do? It'll, it'll stay between the lines. In other words, it, it won't change lanes on you. You have to, in, okay. in fact. When you decide to change lane and you don't turn the turn signal on, it'll fight you. Gotcha. Okay. And the other thing in in uh, in the uh, cruise, it's got uh, adaptive cruise, so I can set three different levels. Uh, it's right up in this area here. There's three different levels when it's in in cruise. I can set three different levels between me and the car in front, gotcha. and it'll it'll try to maintain that distance. So if the car slows down, it'll slow down, and it'll pick up back up the speed that you got it set at. Mm -hmm. Wayne, tell us what kind of technology is in this car that applies to the computer club. What kind of technology? Sure, you got to roll this into a computer somehow. Well, it's got it's got a computer in it, but I have no I haven't got a clue as to what what uh, whether it's uh, Linux or what what it is. I know that uh, on the Tesla it was it was a Linux, but uh, I don't know what what uh, what Toyota's got. You can't run a car on anything other than Linux. <laughs> Hey Wayne, did, did did it have a 360 degree uh, view when you're you know parking or doing yes. something like that? Well, yeah, that's that's another thing that's nice. Uh, when I'm parking, uh, well, it's got a camera in the front, it's got cameras in the uh, in the uh, side mirrors, and it has two cameras in the back. And so. When you're backing up, of course, you know all these cars have to have a backup. The other nice thing I've got is in my rear view mirror, it's got a, a camera in the back. So if I have uh, the the back loaded up with stuff clear to the ceiling, I can still see in the back because I can turn. It the mirror is actually is a is a display. You can you can convert it between being a mirror or actually a display. 
but that's that's not on all the all the features. That's one of the fancy features that yeah, the yeah. XSE has. Uh, the other thing I've got is I've got a heated steering wheel. It's got heated and cooled uh, seats. Does it have automatic braking when if you back up and the cross traffic alert? Yeah, I had that happen to me. I was starting to back up. Some something got in the way <laughs> and it slammed the brakes on. Gotcha. Sounds like it's pretty complete. Yeah, it's it's got just about all the features you can think. Mm -hmm. Does it see black ice on the road? <laughs> I, I don't know about. I haven't, I haven't I haven't I haven't I haven't uh I haven't been uh, driving it in the winter yet, so I've only had it. I'm just Three asking, months. sir. Yeah, just asking. Mm -mm -mm. Do you have to get a new driver's test or license to drive this thing to handle all this technology? I don't know. You don't. Well, I, know? Told, I, I told people that if you're not into computers, forget about getting a Tesla. But uh, this here is not quite as high tech as a Tesla. No special road tests are required. Yeah, no. So they ought it? to. They ought to, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're on your own when you're trying to remember all these different, you know, nuances in the vehicle. Is that right? Well, you can go to the AARP website, and they will uh, let you take a course where you can yeah. learn about a lot of these things online. Yeah, online. Yeah, you can take a free course in the new car technology systems. One time I was pushing an 18 wheeler back in the day and they had these new computerized technologies, but when they get up in the mountains and you're going down the hill and there's wind, snow and ice on the road, they see those things sometimes. And sometimes the, 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 um, the tractor decides to pull and the trailer jack nice and you, so you can't, it's yeah. not that perfect, you know, so. I, like, what, happens, hmm. what happens with modern cars is they don't actually see black ice, mm. but when they hit a surface on which they begin to lose traction, they're mm. very quick to adapt to it. Right. And they go into a special mode. Yeah. yeah. But coming through the mountain there and doing 80 miles an hour and you have 20,000 pounds behind you, so ain't nothing going to stop that baby. No, that's, that's why, why they... That's they why they have run out. Runways. They have those yeah. run out. Uh, that's when they have the run lane, the lanes there. Yeah, sometimes they have, but that's. Uh, yeah, they have the pull out lanes. Well, this has got this has got that stability. All these new cars have this stability control that takes that into account. You can uh, you can turn that on or off. Yep, PKA. Okay, I'll stay at home. Anybody else? Thank you, Wade. Okay. Good job. You want to stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah let me get. Could you send me a picture? <laughs> Did a great job. Good stuff. Well, let me get. Stop your screen. Hey, Wayne. Do you have a version of this slideshow, or could you create one I, I that sent, you can share? I, I sent uh, I sent it to uh, to me Stanford, but I can I can put it uh, out on, on the just put it in the chat. Yeah. yeah, just put the file into chat. It's best That's, if it's PDF, but it's okay if it's slideshow. Why I can't get this thing to go off? Here, go I can, to the I top of the screen. It says stop sharing. No, it's oh, there it is. No, it's red button. It's a red button. There we go. There, there you go. go. Thank okay. you. Now you released it back to all of us. Now, now I'll, you can I'll, look. Yeah, I'll put I'll put mine out. I'll put that uh, slideshow out on the uh, on the, on the chat. chat. Cool. Thank you, Wayne. Does what anyone these... have any questions or comments they'd like to add to this? One of these days, we're all going to be driving cars like these. Yep. Um, I'll, I guess, Wayne, I'll find out about the range anxiety 
issue. My son is planning on driving from round trip from Boston to here and back in his Ford Mach E, which is all electric. Yeah, and that's got about a 200 and about 250 50. 250 mile range. So as you put it, it was 200 before charges. Right. Um, he did map it out because his um, his app that comes with it maps out all the stops, he, the charging point stops. Yeah. He says each one will take about 45 minutes for him to get up to uh, the capacity that he needs right. to go from point to point. He's, um, some you could do shorter, some you have to do longer times right. at. So he estimates it's going to take 20 hours to do a drive from Boston to uh, Chicago. By car, it's normally 15 and a half. So by regular car, gas car. Yep. So it adds roughly five more hours to his drive time. Wow. Um, and maybe an overnight stop. Uh, he is not plan. He's planning on driving straight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Both ways, um, driving from there to here, he's going to be going solo. Uh, but going back, it's him and him and his wife and their uh, infant son. So they are going to be driving overnight, I guess. Is so the they've point. got three people who can drive the car. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's also coming with his dog, and I bet his dog would love to drive the car. Oh so. yeah. <laughs> Bruno. He needs a bit. Yeah. He's a bit younger than we are, so yeah, he's he is a bit endurance. younger. But boy, he's up for a brutal experience. I, yeah. I just don't envy what he's trying to do. In you know, with now uh, what what week is he doing this? Uh, what this week? Is, this is going to be in two weeks. He's coming out here just right the week before Thanksgiving. He's coming in the week hmm. before Thanksgiving. Right. Well, if we don't get a snowstorm, that should be all right. Yeah, we'll, we'll find, out, find out how that's all going to work. Okay, so Pennsylvania has it. But I, I will say, he really, him and his wife both love their Maki, their electric car. Uh, it's a very comfortable car. I've ridden in it many a times when I was out there. As a matter of fact, I just came back from there, um, and uh, it, it was nice being in that car. I can say that it's really nice. Is it a now Ford what, product? What? Go ahead. Is it? Is it a Ford product? It's a Ford yeah. product. Ford. Yep. Made in Mexico. <laughs> all Fords are assembled well, that's, in. Yeah, that's they're all assembled in Mexico. Yeah, they oh, all okay. are. Now, after what, Ford what, closed, what? after Ford closed that Southside plant in Chicago, everything went down to Mexico. Right, Wayne. What yeah. uh, what kind of uh, charge stations is he planning on stopping at? I could not answer your question, but I'm sure it's going to be, you know, some fast charge stations because he says yeah. it's up to like 45 minutes and he'll get up to 90 like percent on those. So he's yeah. probably got to be a level three. Probably. They're probably going to be all level yeah. three spots. He he he's yeah. pretty astute on this stuff and he's uh, technically inclined. He's also in the electrical industry, he works for an electric company. Um, so he's he's real smart on this how many watt how many volts and amps he needs and oh, yeah right. so uh, being as inclined in that area as he is he's just gonna build his own charging station to yeah. into the high voltage he's already That's got right. it well he's got one put in at his house as, as you know in Wakefield uh, yeah yeah you know the Wakefield the, the nice thing about there or in Massachusetts is they get spiff money from their local utility which yes. he's worked for yes. um, he works <laughs> national grid uh but they get spiff money for uh putting in charging stations uh they got credit from the company they got credit from the state uh i think it cost them zero to have the charging station put in which was put in by the city who runs oh. their electric cooperative um <laughs> oh they have a co-op or I called it a cooperative. Uh, yeah. Does he have My GPS? Term. I'm sorry? Does he have GPS location to the next charging station? Yep. He's got yep. it. Like I said, that he just plugged it in, plugged in where he wants to go, and it maps out all the charge points along the interstate. Gotcha. Yeah, so they've you're got not the... driving blind. No, you no, know, you're not. And you know approximately when you're going to get to the charging station. Right. It actually tells you where to go, how to, yeah. what 
exit to go, how far you got to go to it. Some are right on the highway. Some yep. are a little bit off. You might have to drive a mile or two to get to them. It'll tell you how much you got left when, when you get there, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it calculates the whole thing. So, you know, I guess the range anxiety would exist when you are unfamiliar with where you're going to go. Um, right. like my wife and I, we just get in the car and drive. So, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you got it. You got to, got to map it out. You got to map it out. But even, even at that, you can uh, be a little bit concerned about it, whether you're going to make it or not. So, right. Well, well the, the nice, the nice thing about my Tesla, uh, I happen to have free charging the whole life of the car. Ooh. That just happened to be, that yeah, just happened yeah. to be what it, the deal that I got. Uh, actually, that's something they do with all Teslas. No, oh, Tesla. they, no, not they anymore. kind of they kind of roll it in. Oh, well, no. I, Tesla has what a subscription model for it now. No, they they stopped that in 2016. Ah, hmm. but what year was your what year was your Tesla? 2019, but I got a special deal on it. So you didn't oh. get the lifetime, I, which I had the lifetime. You did. Yeah. How so do you could, pay, how I, do you pay for that, the next What that meant was I had lifetime charge at all the Tesla charge stations. Right. See, the thing is with a Tesla charge station, when you plug that in, it, it knows who you are and it goes yep. to your account. Yep. So I think Tesla's thinking about making their charge stations available to other than all Teslas. But currently, well, they're only available for Tesla. In most parts of the country, there is some pushback on this. And there have been people who have deliberately blocked these charging stations and sabotaged them and put trucks in front of them and stuff like that. Well, so like why, in, some, in some in parts the of the country, states. what? It sounds like something that would happen in some of the southern states. Uh, it's not easy. just southern e states. Easy now, easy, easy. It's why not they, just why there. did they do that? Tony, I didn't say Texas, did I? No, I don't know. It don't isn't know. just southern states. <laughs> I it's something that has happened in every state. It's happened in Michigan. It's happened to every place. New Jersey. Yeah. Well, uh, what are they protesting? Unions. No, what they are protesting is electric cars. Because yeah. uh, they want everybody to, some people want everybody to keep on burning gasoline. Okay. Oh, the, the truckers can get diesel, but they can get electricity. All Actually, right. trucks are going over to electric too. <laughs> that will be holding some ass. I mean, some some load. <laughs> they 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 do have them. They're testing them now. Yep. Yeah. They I have don't self drivers. Know how they'll get get embraced, but. Uh, you know, considering how much pollution is coming out of cars and trucks, and our kids need clean air. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they you know. have self driving trucks now, too. Yeah. Yeah, we had those. Yeah. Right. So, you know. All right. I didn't, I didn't know they had self driving trucks. Oh, yeah. They there are some. That like five years ago. Yeah. Wow. And that means a shorter uh, training period for the drivers. So Most the companies of the make more money. trucks have an engineer riding on in intact in the truck to monitor it also. Yes, they do. But it does mean they can get away with fewer employees. And it means that uh, the drivers can go longer periods of time. And they can sleep the while driving. All right. Okay. They don't sleep while driving, but I uh, they are allowed more hours if the truck is self-driving. Yeah. I also uh, read that uh, Met Metra over here, that's the train service, yeah, train. Area, has purchased all a couple of all electric, um, uh, I'm sorry, all electric engines, locomotives, locomotives, yeah. and they're, they're plug in locomotives that they're going to be using on a couple of lines or one line in particular. So they're going to get away from the diesels and go to all electric. Well, they're they're all electric. Yeah, anyway. I, it's just got a diesel engine that generates the electricity. Correct. Yeah, it's basically gonna, an electrical generator on wheels. Right. Yeah. They're going to get away get away from 
the diesel engine part and just convert it all to an electric. Right. Right, right. Oh, yeah. uh, the battery the technology has gotten good enough that they can haul those loads. <laughs> so when the grid can't handle all that load now, what happens? Shut down. That has been discussed, and no, there isn't enough capacity in the electric grid. No. The electric grid would have to go up by about two to four times its current capacity. And if you've looked at what happened in Texas the last winter, the grid isn't up to it. Can't handle right. it. California going all electric. Look it out in California. They're, oh, they're telling the brownouts. Job. Yeah, that's a blue job. Uh, that has to do with maintenance. Uh, Sanford has something to say about well, that. Well, let's not forget that the current uh, administration have passed the Build Back Better plan, which right. has billions and billions dollars put into electrification upgrades throughout the whole country to handle these loads, including millions if not millions of dollars being sent to put in charging stations every 50 miles on an interstate on yeah. okay now the question is where is that electricity going to be sourced well yeah. Yeah. You know, it, this is all this is all to be worked out you know oh, okay okay I, I i don't have the answers for you i'm just right. saying these are things that i know we all have quest, questions and skeptical but it's up to the utilities too to start to step up, which they are doing by building big solar farms, wind farms, and other forms of power generation throughout the country to help raise the ability or to increase the capacity of our grid. Okay, this is all stuff that's got to be done and it's slowly going to be done to help come up with the power that's going to be needed. In uh, another computer group that I uh, attend out here in the Boston area, uh, which has some retired engineers and some MIT people, they are telling us this, combined solar and uh, wind capacity can never do enough That's to right. power the grid. That's the right. The only technologies that can bridge are nuclear fission for now, Mm -hmm. And if they ever get it going, nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. That's correct. That's and until there's mean. nuclear fusion, we are going to have to have small fission plants and nobody wants them. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be doing whatever source out here and National Grid do. They're burning natural gas. Yeah. Pick your nose. Right. I have a brother lives in Texas and he told me, when was it last year sometime? They had a storm and it hit a couple of those windmills and it, they sparked, they fired and they went down the chain and those things were melting like ice cream on a hot day. Yeah, you know? there are some problems, but those are things that can be dealt with. <laughs> I, the wind turbine technology does improve. We've got offshore projects out east that are going like gangbusters. And uh, <laughs> there are other ways. The one thing that's not good is when they call it biomass conversion. And what they're really doing is cutting down forests. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. Okay. Anybody else want any last comments on this subject? Has anybody heard about anything about transmitting electricity over RF? I. You mean like the Tesla principle <laughs> to broadcast no. electricity? That's Another an old word, idea, and physically, it isn't there. Hmm. <laughs> That's not how it, electricity works. <laughs> is there any possibility that would develop in the future? It's not how electricity works. Mm -hmm. You electricity can light up a light is, bulb. You can use the uh, the radio signals yeah. to, to light up a light bulb. We yeah, that's that. low wattage. Low right? wattage you can do. Low wattage you can do but you can't do anything that involves any kind of uh, performance of work by energy. No, no. Yeah. That requires actual current electricity and uh, current electricity is not broadcastable. <laughs> However, it's interesting. Electricity in a circuit does not operate by electrons moving through that circuit, through that wire. Uh, because you know when you flick a switch, the light goes on instantly. That cannot happen if the electrons travel through the wire. Hmm. What happens is an, electromagnetic, uh, an electromagnetic 
wave is propagated on the outside of the wire or even bridges all the way across the circuit if it's a short distance. That's how electricity travels. It does travel through waves, but only if there's a conductor present. Yep, for sure. Well, this was a shocking uh, story tonight, and I... <laughs> Electrifying. Electrifying. Yeah, Tony always come up with those witty things. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, have to I do have a question for you guys. You have to wave. Yes, Tom. Okay. Uh, why is it that uh, the horizontal wind turbine is not being used? I, it really wouldn't make any difference. Sooner. They wouldn't operate any more efficiently or any less. Well, I, I think uh, you could put more of them out closer together than the giant, uh, the giant fans that are out there right now. You mean the vertical one? Vertical it doesn't one. matter. I said horizontal, didn't I? Yes, the yeah, vertical, the vertical ones. ones that spin this way instead oh. of the propeller. Yeah, the ones yeah. that stand up instead of the propeller. They do have which is the wind just... blowing from any direction. Yeah, it, it would blow from any direction. They wouldn't have to rotate, and right. they could be a, a tighter fitting than the. <clears> uh, the fans, they would be real uh, tight. Yeah. You actually need a certain amount of space between adjacent turbines so that you don't get turbulence between them and so that mm -hmm. the wind effect actually does turn the turbine. Uh, well, the biggest mm -hmm. problem they have is with birds and they can solve that problem just by painting black markings on one blade of each turbine. Hmm. Birds then see them. At and night. there has been some there has been some uh, discussion that maybe birds are being confused by the magnetism oh. of these things. Yes, yeah, it's a mating call for them. Yes, could be. <laughs> uh, I will say, Tom, I've only I've seen two locations that had the vertical wind turbines, and both of them had removed them. Uh, one was right on I eighty eight. The um, they had one at the Oasis, or I'm sorry, the uh, toll booth that they've since taken down um, on I-88. That was near Oak Brook. Um, that one is gone, but there was solar panels and there was a vertical wind turbine on that location. And another one was on, uh, was it 294 near O'Hare uh, Airport uh, before the Oasis? There was a commercial building over there that had a couple of vertical ones and they also took them down. So I'll say the probability is they're just not feasible. They're just well, not. I, what they have done is in areas of Minnesota and Illinois downstate, they've made these gigantic farms. On that scale, it becomes feasible. Wind okay. farms. Okay. Well, I, I thought they had them in buildings in downtown Chicago. No. They have had them. We also have had them in Boston on some of our buildings. I, but in urban areas, they don't work so great. Most of our wind is stronger offshore than it is onshore. So, uh, and it's more reliable offshore. It's steadier yeah. wind. It's the so, flatlands uh, that give it. Hmm? The flatlands would be much better areas. Yes. In flatlands, you're great. But in hills, no, you don't really want to be doing it on land. You want to be doing it offshore. How, it is still, how do you uh, dispose of the, the blades when they have um, failed and when they're... That's been a problem. They yeah. do cause environmental issues when they have to be decommissioned, especially the motors, the, the rotors, the brushes. Yeah. I, the part that picks up or generates the electricity that's the part that wears out. And I, they call them the blades, but it's the entire rotor. And then they have to be recycled or whatever you do with them. They don't, don't recycle them. They don't recycle them. They're not recyclable. Right. Same with the solar panels, you know, all these things. You have to have a dump to put them, like to put the airplanes out in the desert and stack them miles high for nothing. But um, you're going to have a yeah. problem with disposal anyway, but that's another story. That's you another story. You we can need to make solar panels. End this topic. <laughs> anyway, yeah. We need to end this topic. So I, I want yeah, to yeah. conclude yeah. and say, is there any other last comments that anyone has? Well, I, I think that the, the, the solution that I see is, is the plug-in hybrid is really the solution at this point. 
I think that's the most practical thing. I think that's a good bridge for many people. Um, and I would love to see the plug-in hybrids make their way into commercial vehicles as quickly as possible, meaning pickup trucks and the vehicles that are used for deliveries throughout the area for the average day contractor to use because they're the ones who are putting on a lot of miles and letting those vehicles sit idle a lot. So, Bob, what about vehicles like that that are 90% not hooked to any, any uh, electric charging? In other words, it, no, no charging, just the hybrid keeps the battery. Is that feasible? Oh, you mean an all electric car? Well, no, he a says plug in hybrid, a plug in hybrid, hybrid that only gets plugged in very seldom because a person lives in an apartment. We have apartment dwellers here, and uh, we just got charging stations put in. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bob, Ford just brought out one of their 150 models with a plug-in mo model. I'm not, not sure it's on the road yet, but it's supposed to be out this year, I think. Oh, the Ford Lightning? Uh, no, the Lightning's a sport truck. But the uh, this is a they've got the one that's got the electric generator and everything that you can support your whole house with now but that's still a gas driven vehicle but they also have an all electric 150 and the proposal was that supposedly they're coming out with a plug in 150 also sure what's what's interesting on on my model i have 110 uh plug in that i can plug in 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 on my car and i noticed on facebook that there was somebody that had a power outage they plugged in, uh, plugged it into their, their RAV4 like mine, and they ran the refrigerator off of it. <laughs> yep. Why you not? You do all kinds of things in a power outage situation. Sure. With these things. That's okay. Um, if there's no other last things, I will say next month's presentation is going to be by Dennis. Dennis, are you here? I see you down there shaking your head. Yes. A date for that. Did you uh do you have a topic for us yet? Uh working on it. Okay. All right. We'll find out what Dennis's presentation will be. What, and what date, what date was that, Stanford? Uh, good question. Um December 25. Pull up a calendar on that one real quick. And see when December will be. December will be the second of December. With right. oh, I'm sorry, the first, the first, December first. December first. Right. And then Harry Nielsen is going to be doing ours in January. And then after that, I'll be sometime in that point, I'll be soliciting for presenters because I'll need to line up next year's calendar. So with that, if there's any other last things uh, someone wants to add, I will conclude the meeting tonight. Thank you all for attending. Thanks for hosting.